I'm so grateful to bring forth the next speaker in this outstanding series of lessons that we've been engaged in called The Courage to Shine, teaching and preaching about what love looks like in public. This series has been very important and very helpful to us because it helps us to bridge the gap in our understanding between our spiritual teachings and then how we mobilize that for social change, for the world that we pray for. It's not enough just to pray about it, but we are being called to take action. And we're showing you how that this, this is a coherent thing. It's a cohesive thing. These things connect. They're not separate. And so the voice that's coming today is no stranger to this work. And we're so happy that we get to, I get to introduce you to our next speaker. And he's no stranger here. In fact, his family has worshiped with us over the years. And as he was in his ministerial formation, he found solace and, and strength by coming into this sanctuary with his wife and children and wife and daughter and is now standing tall as the pastor of the Roseville United Methodist Church. He also served previously as the youth pastor of the great St. Mark's Methodist Church in Sacramento. He completed a doctorate of ministry from the Claremont School of Theology. He preaches and teaches part-time at the Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley. And he has a tremendous love for the spoken word, as you will hear, bringing new approaches to the church and the surrounding community. He is truly in his heart of heart a theological activist. He is an educator's activist. He's an activist with a heart to ensure that the academy brings the intellectual insight that is necessary to inform a whole new league of leaders. And I am so happy that at long last he is going to grace this pulpit. And when I asked him to come, he was an instantaneous, no hesitation, yes, to being here with you today. And you're going to find out why I love him so much and why the community values and treasures his important voice. Let's welcome to this pulpit the Reverend Dr. Massier Evans. Let's give him a great big unit of Sacramento welcome as he brings our message today. Welcome, Dr. Massier Evans. Oh, wow. Amen. Amen. Good morning. And peace to you. I send you greetings from First United Methodist Church of Roseville. Um, and I had some things I was going to say, but I am full. <laughs> I am full, and I feel so good being here today. Um, I want to first extend my gratitude to, um, of course, Rev Kev, his wife, Anita, um, the staff here, um, the whole family. Listen, I got welcomed in here like, like a champ. They literally sung me into the room. I, I was sung to in the room, and it was so beautiful just to be here once again. We, we live in Sacramento, and we first moved to this area, as Rev Kev said, we came to this church. This church, you know, aligns with our shared values, and the beautiful diversity of this place is, is organic and natural and genuine in a true reflection of what we will call the beloved community. And remember, we sat with Rev. Kev in his office, and we, we chopped it up. It was, it was beautiful. And, you know, I'm a Methodist minister, but, you know, my lineage, right, goes in new thought, goes through Michael Beckwith, and then directly through Reverend Deborah Johnson, who is my mentor, who was here just a few weeks ago, I believe. And so I am so happy to be here. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I've, I've served with Rev. Kev in many places, you know, as I now serve in, in, in Roseville. And there's one thing about Rev. Kev is that he's incredibly uh, gifted, as you know, and articulate and just 
spiritual and funny. He's a funny dude. Y'all know that as well. Um, But more than all of that, he's my brother. And I think that's the thing that I love the most about being here today. Is, is we're, we're brothers not based on blood. We're brothers not based on the frequencies of how many times we see or speak to each other. It's, it's a soul thing. We recognize each other. And he calls me up to my best self. And in fact, in many ways, I would not be who I am right now if not for the friendship and support of RevKev and by extension, this community. And so I'm so very grateful to be here today, and I'm honored to be at this pulpit. Amen? Amen. Now, as a, as a pastor, they got me working on Sundays. I mean, like, every Sunday. <laughs> I mean, like, today? Every day. I mean, every. So it's interesting. I don't get to visit places too often. But I tell you, as soon as I came in through this door... I knew that I wasn't here as a visitor because as was already, you know, kind of implied, this is a place of home. So I'm glad to be here, yes. Before we begin, let's just say a quick word of prayer. Hmm. Dear God, in a few brief moments we have together, I pray that you will open our hearts so that we may receive that which you have for us to receive. And as always, may the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. All right. So, speaking of home, there's a place of deep home in my memory. I'm from up north. I'm an East Coast cat. But I remember these trips down south as a kid to the seemingly ancient church in Maryland. I remember the sun-bleached white paint barely holding on to that little wooden structure down road that sat in the lowlands at the bottom of the hill near Hall Creek. This was the soil of my parents and my ancestors, a rural landscape of farm plots spotted with peeling birches and old oaks and deep pine woods and spirits that spoke in breezes. I remember filing under the hot country sun with people who looked and felt like me, a kaleidoscopic vision of black and brown faces, and they sung tried songs and prayed true prayers with open hearts and closed eyes. They praised God with raised hands that pointed heavenwards, puncturing the thick summer air with their summons in that small space of that sanctuary. I remember seeing this this, 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 the crisp white uniform of an elderly usher, an ancient lady child with gray eyes who extended her wrinkled black cup hand to my young cheek and said, child, declare, you don't look just like your granddaddy. <laughs> you know, I could still hear the creaking sounds of wooden pews holding the shifting bodies of those whose bodies toil too long in hot backfields or as domestics up in Miss So-and-So's house up road. I can still feel the breeze of paper fans sponsored by some funeral home, moving the humid air, the picture of Martin Luther King, or praying hands moving back and forth, back and forth. These are my roots, y'all. And the streams of black folk religious traditions that fed the rhythm of my faith journey was one that led me to seminary, and it eventually allowed me to encounter the God that we know of many names. It's a legacy of spirituality from our ancestors, a people with a creative and irrepressible faith forged in fire, those who knew deep down within their souls that nothing can hold them back from knowing their oneness with God and the divine in many and varied ways is always trying to tell us something. You know, I, this is a Women's History Month. And as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about Alice Walker. And in, in the color purple, it shines a beautiful light on the religious expressions of which I was talking about. Again, originally, a book originally written in 1982 
This novel documents the traumas and the gradual triumph of Celie, black teenage girl in, in the rural Jim Crow era South in Georgia. And it highlights the themes of liberation and full community restoration and radical love and the wisdom that affirms undivided sacred presence, whether in the church house or in the juke joint. Here we say, we will say that God is one and there is no spot where God is what? Not, yes. In 1985, the film adaptation gave us quotes that became like sacred scripture within the culture. All you need to see is silly somebody doing this. What does this mean? <laughs> Everything you do. Or as Mary now. You see, look, look. We, all my life I've got to fight. See, y'all know this. This is scripture. And there's many iconic images, right? One of note shows the character Seely and Suge Avery, child, that little shimmy, shimmy red dress she had, right? They were walking in this expansive field of purple wildflowers and taking her cues from nature, Suge, the seemingly unlikeliest of theologians, opines about God. And while noticing or considering the flowers of the field, she beautifully and bluntly says, I think it truly pisses God off if you walk by the color purple in the field somewhere and don't notice it. Excuse my language, that was Shug. Shug gave me something. <laughs> I thought of this movie when I visited Israel Palestine a little more than three years ago. Now, near Nazareth, there lies the ruins of the city called Sepphoris. This ancient city was probably where Joseph and his more famous son, Jesus, was probably conscripted by Herod to rebuild in the first century. And it sits on top of this large hill overlooking the Galilee Valley low. And for, for miles around that site, there are these vast fields. And these fields that Jesus most likely wandered through would have undoubtedly sparked his youthful imagination it would have later, and I'm sure, from a place of deep memory, informed his teachings. Our verses today come, talk about worry, as you heard. And they come from his famous sermon on the mount. In it, Jesus says, look to the birds in the sky. They don't sow seeds or harvest grain or gather crops into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And like Shug Avery, who took her cues from nature... And drawn upon his deep memory of his hometown fields around Nazareth, Jesus then says, notice, or as we know it in many versions, consider. Consider how the lilies of the field grow. They do not wear themselves out with work and they don't spin cloth. But I say to you that even Solomon in all of his splendor wasn't dressed like one of these. Jesus finishes his thought by asking a rhetorical question. He says, if God, and I'm paraphrasing, if God dresses grass of the field so beautifully, even though it's alive today and gone tomorrow, won't God do that much more for you? And get this, this is just an aside, right? The Hastings Bible Dictionary says that these grasses that we're talking about, sometimes referred to as the lilies of the field, come from the gladiolus and iris species. And that, and this is a quote, it grew among the grains, often overtopping it and illuminating the broad wheat fields of Galilee with their various shades of pinkish to deep violet purple. Jesus' invocation of the lilies of the field, along with Alice Walker's The Color Purple, offers us a beautiful and insightful metaphor into God's grace. This is particularly relevant in times when worry is not only present, but indeed warranted. And I'm talking about those sometimes moments when you cannot easily discern the where's, the what's, the why's, and especially the, the how's. Jesus knew the pressures of the poor and oppressed in occupied first century Palestine in the same way that God knows the pressures that we are facing in our homes and in our communities and in our nation and in our world. 
Worry sometimes is warranted when we see the war and conflict happening all across the globe in Ukraine and beyond, or where immigrants at the southern border are not treated like humans but as pawns, or when gun violence runs unchecked within our communities and neighborhoods, or where there's people who lack access to proper housing or adequate health care or those amongst us who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Worry is sometimes warranted when you look at the witness of the church and see the gospel diminished to slogans and to some folks yelling about banning books and classes but remaining silent in the face of anti-black and anti-Semitic violence or systemic injustice or the threat felt by those within the LGBTQ plus community or theologically justifying the petulance in our politics that gives voice to our violence and deepens divisions and cynically separates us one from another. And sometimes a warranted worry takes on personal dimensions, like when one begins to question if they are ever going to get through the problems that they are facing, like Celie in The Color Purple. Sometimes you can't help but wonder if you can overcome the forces in life that seem to be conspiring to extinguish your light to dampen your joy, or put a ceiling on your own sense of possibility. These types of worries are real. And these natural feelings of anxiety and angst that arise from the concerns of life affirm our humanness. However, I believe that when Jesus says, do not worry, we are not being taught to act as if what is happening is not. No. We're being taught to not get stuck in worry, to not allow that worry to pitch a tent within our minds such that we co-sign a sense of separation from the God who is abundant in his presence. We're being taught, as a, as a folk singer once said, that don't let the devil ride you, right? Why? Because, because if we quiet ourselves long enough, then we can begin to hear a truth that emerges from the midst of worry. We begin to hear the whisper of Shug Avery in that field of wildflowers, or Jesus' voice on that mount long ago saying, consider, consider. Now to all of my metaphysicians up in here, when I was going through practitioner training with Reverend Deborah Johnson, I, I learned about how our thoughts are prayers, right? We talked about affirmative prayer and the law of mind, the, 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 the creative power of our thoughts. We, we, we learned about how what we think and how we speak, right, empowers what we bring as truth into our experiences. I, I learned how to guard my heart, but I also learned how to mind my mind, right? And the word consider, it, it means to think carefully. So my heart's ears picked up. When I, when I heard the master teacher saying, consider. And so I say to you today the same, that when faced with worries, consider. Just like Shug Avery did. Consider the flowers of the field in the purple shade of God's grace by knowing, as my spiritual mentor said, just because things are out of your control doesn't mean that they're out of God's control. Amen. That indeed... This world can seem crazy, but as Howard Thurman said, the, the contradictions of this life are not final. That in the end, there's a unity of life that is law and, and unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word, as Martin Luther King says. But in the meantime, we roll up our sleeves and we do our part and we do our work because we are called to be a force for good. That's what we said earlier. So we consider the flowers of the field in a purple shade of God's grace by knowing that even when churches fail, God does not. That we, that we can be a true body, a true body, a corporate vessel of God's ever unfolding expression of love in this universe such that we can be what Cornell West implied when he said that justice is what love looks like in public. And as I... As I say to my Roseville folks all the time, they get tired of me here. They, I say this all the time. I say, community is not just a noun. 
It is a verb. It is a way of being. It is a way of seeing our lives intrinsically interconnected with each other such that we are caught up in an inescapable network of mutuality, as King says. It, it means that no one is left out, enabling a more beloved community where the sacred worth of all people and all things, including the earth itself, is honored. Consider the flowers of the field and the purple shades of God's grace by knowing that the evidence of God's presence, especially in our lowest of low moments, may or may not come from the folks that are sitting around you. But God, who is always trying to tell us something, may speak to you in the wind and through the trees and in the sky and in the rain. And sometimes this God speaks to you in the whispers as you look into the mirror and you sometimes remember what your pastor sometimes says, that you are a one-time event in human history and no one can do you like you. And sometimes, sometimes a remembrance of our divine imprint may shine up above our heads as far as the stars, or it might be as near as last drawn breath that testifies to the divine breath that breathes through us, giving us life and life to the full as the spiritual qualities continue to seek to express itself in and through and as us as all times. Consider, consider. Unity in all of these considerings that I've been talking about, in the kind of mosaic midst of all of these metaphoric shades of purple, I am knowing and affirming that God not only knows our needs, but is also always willing to provide for them. And in this knowing, this knowing allows us to have the assurance such that we can stop worrying about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. And this allows us to consider or to fix our minds to the truth, especially in those sometimes moments when in creeps the lengthening shadows of warranted worries. And this allows us to notice the, the pops of the color purple that surrounds us, which is the grace of God that not only sustains the birds and the flowers, but sustains our very lives. And this allows us to truly know from a place deep down within our souls that no matter what is going on, if we anchor our hearts to the truth of our oneness with God, then in the words of the great prophet Kendrick Lamar, <laughs> I messed up, homie, you messed up, but if God got us, then we gonna be all, we gonna be all right. <laughs> Family, we are a, a far way in time and space from Jesus giving a sermon in first century Palestine. Or we're worlds away from Seely and Shug over in Jim Crow era Georgia. But as sure as that quaint Methodist church in the country parts of Southern Maryland lives in my deep memory, I could testify today to the power of considering. And in those sometimes moments when we begin to worry, if you have eyes to see the color purple or the grace of God that surrounds us with a beauty that transcends all the splendor of Solomon, then we can be strengthened in the promise that God still got us and will show us the way because as Kendrick Lamar once said, we gonna be all right. Amen. <laughs>